Uh, let me tell you, uh, first of all, why uh, there's an empty chair uh, at this table. Uh, and it has to do with the fact that uh, the Bangladesh government uh, asked the American Bar Association to convene this panel, a neutral forum to discuss the uh, work of the Bangladesh International Crimes Tribunal. The ABA agreed to do that, uh, and we were set to work on uh, creating a program that would be balanced with all points of view represented uh, with respect to the work of the court. Uh, about two weeks ago, the Bangladesh government informed the ABA that they would not be sending a representative to this uh, program. Uh, there were two who were being uh, considered, and we thought one or both of them might come. Uh, we tried very hard to uh, have someone from the government or representing the government's point of view, but to no avail. And so the issue a couple of days ago was do we cancel the program or do we uh, move on and hear from the two speakers who are here, uh, who I'll introduce in a moment. So uh, that is why we have a slight imbalance, but I know that the speakers and all of us will uh, do the best we can to nonetheless make it a balanced presentation about what the court has done that's positive and what the court has done that needs attention and needs uh, support, needs help. So with that brief uh, introduction, uh, let me tell you how the, what the format of this program will be. Uh, we only have until, uh, I understand, uh, quarter of one, which means we have an hour and ten minutes. I believe in making every minute uh, meaningful so that we will move quickly. Uh, I will ask, uh, the format is that I will ask questions of the two uh, panelists. I will ask them to be brief in their responses so that we can cover, uh, I have maybe half a dozen questions for them, uh, but I want to get to your questions. So uh, we will move quickly along in hopes that we get to that point where you will ask your questions. Um, that's the format. Um, Kip has told you about the American Bar Association uh, commitment to international criminal justice for four decades, uh, and in particular, uh, the work that we're doing with the International Criminal Court. And I'm going to circle back to that connection, the ICC and the Bangladesh Court, uh, in one of my final questions for the panelists. With that, let me give you some uh, brief introduction of our two distinguished uh, panelists. First, Ambassador Stephen J. Rapp, sitting to my immediate left, uh, is Ambassador at Large, heading the Office of Global Criminal Justice in the U.S. State Department. Uh, Ambassador Rapp was appointed by President Obama, uh, confirmed by the Senate, and he assumed his duties on September 8, 2009. Prior to his appointment, Ambassador Rapp served as Prosecutor of the Special Court for Sierra Leone, beginning in January 2007. He was responsible for leading the prosecutions of former Liberian President Charles Taylor and other persons alleged to bear the greatest responsibility for the atrocities committed during the Civil War in Sierra Leone. During his tenure in Sierra Leone, his <coughs> office won the first convictions in history for recruitment and use of child soldiers, for sexual slavery, and forced marriage as crimes under the international humanitarian law regime. Uh, Toby Cadman, our other panelist to my further left, is a member of the International Criminal Law Bureau, undertaking international legal cases and providing advice, uh, consultancy, and training services to governments, <coughs> international organizations, and private clients. He specializes in the areas of war crimes, extradition and mutual legal assistance, judicial review, and human rights law. He lectures extensively on international law, criminal procedure, and human rights, and he has provided extensive advice and training to judges, prosecutors, and lawyers throughout the Balkans and Southeast Asia. He has appeared on matters before the International Criminal Court, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the International Crimes Tribunal for Bangladesh, the European Court of Human Rights, and the Bosnia, uh, Bosnia State Court and the UN Human Rights Committee. My first question uh, is addressed to Ambassador Rep. 
Uh, and I'm going to ask Ambassador Rapp to give us your brief overview of the Bangladesh International Crimes Tribunal. Some of us in the room know that uh, in 1971, atrocities were committed, leading to, in 1973, the adoption of, a, of an act of, in law, uh, of law in um, Bangladesh, uh, creating the court. But nothing happened between 1973 and 2009, when the government finally took steps to implement the 1973 Act. And it did so in 2010, creating the first uh, tribunal with three judges, seven prosecutors, and others. And since then, there's been another uh, uh, panel created. So the courts have only been in operation uh, from 2010 to now. So Ambassador Rapp, with that brief uh, intro, give us your uh, overview, your comments about its creation, its essential characteristics, uh, its important events, and its brief history. Well, thank you very much, Michael. It's a great pleasure to be here uh, today. Um, I think it, it's important first to note that this is, this is about uh, mass killings and, and other uh, horrendous crimes that occurred in 1971. And, and I'm here representing the United States government always make it absolutely clear that we support uh, uh, bringing persons to justice that were responsible uh, for those uh, atrocities and uh, it's part of the mission of my office. Uh, I work with international, the International Criminal Court, our engagement with it even though we're not a member, uh, supporting uh, its prosecutions with other international tribunals but also with national systems. Uh, and and uh, uh, President Obama's uh, atrocity prevention initiative is founded on the idea that uh, holding people to account for mass atrocities is a core national security interest of the United States, and it's one of the ways that we prevent uh, these horrendous acts of, of, of killings. Uh, it is important to remember the history here, too, and, and in that I, I recommend people go to the, the new book that is out, uh, Gary Bass's book called The Blood Telegram, which has uh, gotten a lot of uh, favorable comment, uh, but describes to a large extent American policy in 1971, uh, which uh, in, in some respects was, was under the unfortunate the position that the Nixon and, and Kissinger government took at that time, uh, which uh, uh, opposed the liberation of Bangladesh, uh, tilted very much to Pakistan uh, because of the uh, concerns, and because it was then uh, secretly providing an entree to China and to Nixon's opening to China that occurred in 1972. Uh, but at the same time, uh, uh, Senator Kennedy and, and others in the States recognized the horrors that were going on, and our own consul in, uh, in Dhaka, Arthur Blood, uh, sent back uh, telegrams describing what began in March of 1971, which was the targeting of, of, of really thousands of, of civilians uh, for killing and, 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 and other atrocities, uh, and uh, crimes that went on throughout that year in which uh, hundreds of thousands of people were killed, an exact estimate of people can debate that, but there's no question that at least 10 million people were forced into exile into, into India because of that. And, and throughout that period, uh, there were uh, killings of, of people who were Hindu, uh, killings of, of persons who were uh, of, of secularists uh, who opposed. Uh, you know, part of the issue, of course, was the fact that the Islamic Republic of Pakistan would be broken up and that there would be a secular uh, uh, Republic of, of, of Bangladesh if, if a war was, uh, was won. And, and so there was that element of, 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 of the conflict that was, was truly horrendous. So we very much want to see those that are responsible for this targeted killing of innocents uh, uh, held, uh, held to account. Uh, in 1973, as you say, the, the government then, under, under Sheikh Mujib, passed a law that uh, provided for, for trials in the International Crimes Act. Uh, and this becomes important in terms of a of our later engagement, they also passed an amendment to the Constitution which said that none of the other rights that apply uh, to, uh, to, to, to cases in Bangladesh for serious crimes apply in this International Crimes Act. It's kind of a standalone, sui generis International Crimes Tribunal. And I think it may have been envisioned initially uh, that some of the persons from Pakistan who were engaged in, in, in leading the, the, these killings that were then in custody uh, held as prisoners in, uh, in Bangladesh might have been tried. Uh, but in the end, they were all sent home as, as part of an exchange. And so uh, the focus when we came around to 2009 has been exclusively to prosecute those persons who are Bangladeshi, not those that may have been responsible, uh, who are now in Pakistan. 
And of course, we also recognize that uh, in the course of 40 years, a lot of people, including certainly some very senior people, will have, will have, will have passed away. Uh, we, uh, nonetheless, uh, from an American point of view, or, and I think from a global point of view, believe that it's important to achieve accountability, even if late, better, better late than, than never. And uh, you know, I'll be off next week in Germany, and at one point advocating uh, that they pursue a, a couple of uh, Nazi cases, people uh, who are and they're 89 years old, they were involved in Auschwitz and death camps. It's important that those cases be prosecuted, even though a long time has passed, because you send a signal that if you commit horrendous atrocities, uh, that there is no escaping it in this life. And that's an important part of, 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 uh, of, uh, of, of the deterrent that we want to create uh, to these uh, to these worst uh, crimes. In, in any case, in 2009, as I indicated, the government then, uh, under under uh, Sheikh Hasina, um, went back and looked at the law, made some amendments to it, established an international crimes tribunal in 2010, and, and I was invited to come in, in uh, by the government to, to advise them on this, and uh, and we can talk about uh, some of that advice uh, to your other questions. Uh, but I wrote a, uh, after visiting for, for a week, uh, wrote an extensive letter making some recommendations, not as a as someone you know sort of speaking to on high about how they should do it, but looking to their own obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, the treaties that. Uh, that Bangladesh had itself adopted, and uh, some of the uh, some of the provisions that have been adopted in, in international or ad hoc or hybrid courts, uh, which Bangladesh has supported, looking to uh, uh, to bring some of those into effect. Uh, but a key part of my recommendations uh, was also that it was very important that this uh, that this process have a very public strategy, and that as as you go about the business of prosecuting a crime in the international sphere of these international crimes. One recognizes you can't prosecute everybody. There are also going to be people that are outside your jurisdiction that you can't get a hold of. There are going to be many people that have died. And, and so you basically be able to say, this is our strategy. This is our approach. This is why we're pursuing this kind of case and not this kind of case. And, and to have a kind of an outreach and a dialogue. And, and one of the things in, in Sierra Leone we did, where you indicated I was chief prosecutor, there, we were to prosecute only those with the greatest responsibility. Myself and my predecessors and other personnel in the court helped set up an outreach program where we traveled the country and answered questions about what we were doing. Because in the end, we prosecuted 13 people for crimes in which hundreds of thousands of people had been victims and in which thousands of individuals had been potential perpetrators. So it was very important to explain how it was, why you were doing what you were doing and why you were selecting these cases. And it would have been very important to have that. Kind of effort, and, and frankly, that's one thing that, that hasn't happened here, and it's been, you know, it's, it led to conclusions of the, the uh, by some that the process isn't fair in terms of, of who's been selected. That people are selected not based upon the seriousness of their conduct in 1971, but on their positions today, for instance. But in, in any case, we can we can talk about that later. But uh, the point is that uh, that a process was commenced. Uh, Toby can talk about the numbers that have been charged. It's still a relatively modest number of teens of people that have been, been, been brought in, and in cases that have been pursued in trial. And, uh, and uh, I'm glad to discuss how that's gone, how my own recommendations uh, were, were, were looked at and accepted or rejected, and, and, and where we stand today. Good. Well, that's a good uh, setting of the table, if you will, about the background of the court, uh, when it was created, how it was created, a little bit about how it's been functioning. Uh, my next question is for Toby Cadman. Uh, Toby, who has written extensively about the court, not only about the Bangladesh International Crimes Tribunal, but other tribunals. Uh, and what I'm going to ask uh, Toby to do for us is to, uh, uh, going against uh, his grain, because I know he's, he's written critically about the court, but I'm going to ask him uh, to limit his answer to this question to what he can say that's positive about the court. Later question, he'll have a chance to uh, speak about what he thinks is not positive and what needs to be done. But, so, uh, and beforehand, uh, when I told Toby that Toby I was gonna ask him that question, he said, well, that won't take me very long to answer. Uh, so, but, but go ahead. Thank you. Um, and also, um, I'd like to express my gratitude for um, being invited and being able to speak about this uh, very important issue. 
um, and also uh, express some sorrow that the, the chair between you and Stephen is actually empty because one of the one of the biggest challenges that we've faced, and I think Stephen and I have uh, sat on at least two previous uh, panel discussions, is that uh, it, it tends to, to, to appear one-sided because the, the government really never comes forward to put their, their own version of events, um, particularly when, uh, I, I would say it's more disappointing when they're the ones that actually requested uh, this panel discussion in the first place. Um, but responding to your question, yes, it's a very easy question to answer because there's, there's really very little that I can say. Um, and as, as you very kindly said in, in your introduction to me, I've been involved with a number of different tribunals and uh, judicial processes to deal with atrocity crimes and, and they all have their positive and negative uh, aspects. Um, no judicial process that, uh, that, that looks to justice and accountability for past crimes is without criticism. Um, but I think this is probably the one which is more criticised than, than any other process that I've ever encountered. Um, but in terms of what you could possibly say uh, that is positive, um, I would really only, only say two things. Um, I'm, I'm a great believer in national tribunals and, and these processes being, being dealt with where the crimes were committed. Um, I spent a number of years working in Bosnia um, setting up with international assistance that would, that would look to, to, to address the, those crimes in Bosnia. And it was a very successful process. So I think there is certainly something to say when the government is given the opportunity to, to deal with the matter themselves, even with international assistance. So I think the, 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 first, the first point is that, yes, there should be a system of justice for accountability, and, and ideally the government should be given and they have been given the opportunity. And I have, regrettably have to say, they have failed when they doing that. But trying to keep uh, as positive as I can. Um, the other point is that uh, I completely agree that I don't think it matters how long we wait. There should be a system, uh, whether it's five years or 40 years. Uh, I think the fact that 43 years have passed is not a reason not to. It is incredibly difficult to, to establish such a process in Bangladesh where, where everything is so polarized um, and everything revolves back to the 1971 war liberation. It's very clear that the country has not moved very far since 1971 in terms of dealing with this process. And I just want one of the points that, uh, that Steve mentioned when, when we were looking at what actually happened. The, the process and was started in 1973. It was much more of a military court process. It was aimed to put on trial 195 uh, Pakistani prisoners of war, and those determined to be those most responsible for of the atrocities, from committing atrocities on one side, from the Pakistani side. And they were put on trial, and they, they were repatriated back to Pakistan um, on the basis that Pakistan was put them on trial, which they <coughs> And so Pakistan has a lot to answer for um, in this regard as well. Um, but the reason why they were repatriated was because there was a general amnesty, um, and it was recognized in the interest of peace and stability that Bangladesh should um, forgive and forget. And these are the words of um, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman. And so what, what you have is much more of a focus on reconciliation than accountability, uh, which I think you can't really have one without the other. Uh, there had to be a system of accountability before there could even be a discussion of reconciliation. So what, what we're looking at is that the, the process started, it was then stopped, um, and then for 40 years uh, the people of Bangladesh sat and waited, um, and regrettably the, the response we had was the one that we have now. Right. Just, we didn't mention this at the outset, but it's worth keeping in mind that, that in, uh, on the kind of positive side, just to add to what you were saying, Tony, uh, in 1971, when these atrocities happened, uh, there was no international criminal court, of course. Uh, 
the idea had been floated, had been discussed from the Nuremberg trials in 1946 or 7 forward, but there were forces in the world, uh, including the Cold War and suspicions that, that made the idea of, an, of a permanent international criminal court not workable. So in 1971, when, when these events happened, uh, you, you need to give some credit to the government for uh, enacting the law in 1973. That's, that's a good, good thing. The bad thing is that nothing happened until 2009. The International Criminal Court, which was uh, created in 1998 in Rome, uh, became operational in 2002. But, but the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court is limited to uh, uh, events and situations that happened after the creation of the uh, ICC. So if anyone is wondering why didn't the ICC step in and take these cases, because it cannot. Under its uh, uh, mandate, the Rome Statute, the ICC cannot touch a case like this. Um, so that, that's just for, for background purposes. But now I'm going to give each of our two um, speakers a chance to talk about uh, the bad. What, what are the concerns about what's been happening with this tribunal from 2009 to now? Uh, what is what do you find most troublesome, and uh, why? Why are these th why have these things happened uh, in your point of view, Steve? Well, uh, first of all, understand uh, uh, we wanted very much uh, to engage, and we're willing to, uh, to to come to the country and, and have been there four times, and, uh, and and are still willing uh, to do that. I did, by the way, have a call from the Bangladesh ambassador this morning who asked for a meeting. I said, well, maybe at th today's session, and uh, they came back and said, no, he wasn't available then, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak with him in the next uh, day or so and, and continue to, uh, uh, to press issues that we think are important. And, and, and in doing that, I always want to emphasize that uh, um, you know, we're not antagonistic to, 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 to the government or to anyone involved in this process. We think that a, that a process that follows uh, international standards, particularly those that are in the international covenants uh, that, uh, that Bangladesh itself has adopted, and, and that has a fair and just process, not that everyone will completely like, uh, we know even in good trials, people, family members and associates are unhappy about convictions or other people may be unhappy about acquittals. There will always be objections to those, those, those kinds of things, but, uh, but to the extent that this is done right, uh, then it can, uh, can help a society heal. And, and I know in these unfortunate situations where people talk about crimes that say occurred in 1915, like in Armenia, uh, there were no international trials, no processes, and, and you wish there had been, that some of these issues have been resolved in, in, in the judicial process. And so having a judicial process can, can help uh, uh, resolve later political things where people feel that they were unjustly treated uh, and, and that can justify uh, than visiting, uh, uh, you know, sort of retribution on the children or grandchildren and great grandchildren of, of the people involved in the crime, to, to truly, uh, uh, you know, uh, honor the victims, uh, uh, it's important to, to have a process that will be something that, that uh, people of good faith uh, on all sides can, can support. Uh, now, in terms of, of, of the approach that we took, uh, you know, we started with this. This, this challenging aspect that uh, that the statute was was put in in 1973, uh, it didn't reflect sort of modern developments in international law. It was frankly the Nuremberg Statute with a few uh, a few changes. Now, of course, it's important to note that you can't you can't come along in 2009 and say, okay, we're going to pass a statute for crimes that happened in 1971, because that would violate the rule that you know you. Uh, shouldn't pass the crime, as we call it in America, ex post facto law. But, but international law, and particularly the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, says you can retroactively adopt the statute in this area, uh, provided it reflects the international law that was in effect at the time. And, uh, and so it is possible to prosecute crimes against humanity. It is pros possible to prosecute genocide. It is possible to prosecute war crimes. But you have to be very careful that you're looking to the law of 1971 and to Nuremberg and the cases and to the developments that occurred and the commentaries and everything that occurred uh, in the 50s and 60s and 70s uh, in, in, in order to do that. And uh, 
we uh, urged them on the substantive law to uh, that there were ways that they could, uh, you know, they could, if they couldn't amend the statute, they could come along and, uh, and and provide practice directions or rule amendments that would sort of lay out what the elements of these crimes are, so that people would know definitely what needed to be proved and what didn't need to be proved. That was one of my first suggestions, and they, there was a great reluctance to do that. Now, to be frank, over time. Uh, in not in the charge framing decisions where I think it would have been best so people would have known what needed to be proved and what, what if it weren't proved would lead to a not guilty verdict. Eventually we have seen, if you look at the case at the decisions, and I know uh, Toby can criticize them even then, uh, but there has been greater recognition of international law and development. So from a legal standpoint, some of these decisions I think have gotten stronger in terms of, of, of the legal analysis. And I, and I think that's, that, that's very positive. But beyond that, uh, there are the other questions about the rights of the accused. Uh, and, and one of the unfortunate aspects, I know when this happens in every one of, uh, of atrocity crime situations, when they're, when they're great horrors, is that those that are involved or the survivors of, of these uh, tend to view the, the, the people who committed these crimes as automatically guilty. And, and even anyone that goes in and represents them is how can you how can you be sitting there at the council table with these horrible criminals, and and somehow there's this attitude that because the crimes are so horrible, we should somehow uh, uh, make it more difficult for these people to be represented. And, and sitting here with the ABA, it's of course, ideas everyone's entitled to 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 advocacy uh, uh, within the bounds of the law, uh, zealously uh, uh, representing the rights of. of persons that are charged. And, and just because someone is charged doesn't mean they're guilty. And, and, and that's a, a crucial aspect. Of, but but this is, that's a general principle. But more specifically, in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, and you know, I invite people to look at it. I mean, it's the, the major international uh, you know, uh, human rights convention. Uh, there's uh, long provisions about the rights of the accused, and, and the right to be represented by the consul, and the right of silence, and the right for your consul to, to be appointed if you're indigent, and, and the, uh, the right of appeal, the right to, uh, to have time and facilities uh, to prepare. And, uh, and understand under Bangladesh law, a lot of these rights exist in their courts, in their ordinary courts. If you're charged with murdering 10 people on the street today, uh, you're, there's a long tradition of your rights being honored. But in this 1973 law, they threw out all the rights that applied otherwise. And so the approach that I took was, well, let's, let's bring the rights back in, because after all, you've adopted the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, and let's incorporate these rights into, in, into, this, uh, in, into this code of procedure. Uh, and to some extent, I will note that there are some of them that they then did uh, uh, adopt, uh, but there are others uh, that were not adopted. And, and then in actual practice, <coughs> it has been difficult for people to, to enforce these rights. I mean, uh, Toby will talk about one of the challenges as, as one follows the trials is uh, certainly, and it's in the, uh, it's in the International Covenant, that uh, the accused shall have the same right uh, as, as, the, uh, as the prosecutor uh, to call witnesses and, and to bring them to court and, and to compel their attendance. And this follows in, in all proceedings, procedures. One of the things that famously happened in, in the cases there is there were some of the witnesses that the prosecution were calling that didn't appear. And, and of course, something else that we were concerned about is witness protection, because there was a potential of intimidation on all sides. And just because a witness withdraws doesn't mean that witness is a liar. They may be intimidated. Uh, but the defense then sought to compel those witnesses because they had information that those people perhaps recanted and indeed uh, were going to testify truthfully about what happened uh, to come into court. And they faced enormous obstacles and were essentially prohibited from calling those individuals in. And when they got a volunteer uh, to come in, that person disappeared from outside the courthouse and, and was uh, dropped over in India, et cetera, and wasn't available to them. And so it, it's in practice, you've got these uh, the, the, the deprivation of the rights that would otherwise apply in an ordinary case in Bangladesh that has, I think, given us the greatest pause. Now, after we were engaged in making a series of recommendations, and my you know, 10 page letter is, is in the public sphere, in fact, the government, I think, put it out there. Uh, and, and so you can see all of the specific recommendations, and I can go into them. But uh, one of the other things we did is saying whatever's in the rules, 
um, you know, in practice, you can do better. You can find in the law and the procedures uh, guidance. That you don't necessarily have to have it in the rules. You can have judge-made uh, uh, decisions. And, and certainly, to the extent you've gotten it in the rules, you've got to follow those. So we, we uh, very much wanted to see the trials monitored, and uh, we supported a, a program uh, through, uh, through the East-West Center and the Berkeley War Crimes Center, uh, uh, which, is, which you will find their site at, uh, in uh, Bangladesh trialobserver.org, one long word, and, and you can go on and get reports uh, about what's happening in court on, on a daily basis, and, and you can read about these challenges, and, and we're hoping by doing that to, to encourage the, the, the observance of, of these rights. Hold your thought in just a second, Steve, but the thought occurred to me uh, when you were talking about the, the uh, omission in the 1973 Act of, of these fundamental uh, assurances fairness and, and the representation and so on. You, you, those of you in the room who are familiar with the Nuremberg trial will know that uh, in the charter, the London charter that led to the creation of the uh, Nuremberg Tribunal, uh, of the four powers, uh, Churchill and Stalin uh, took the view, Churchill took the view that why are we wasting time with trial at all? These, these people are heinous criminals. Let's just put them to death, period. So the point of view that we see in the 1973 Act harkens back to even Churchill. Stalin's uh, viewpoint was, well, let's have trials, but just, uh, just to determine uh, how quickly we can put them to death, essentially. You know, that, that, that kind of a trial, again. So it doesn't excuse what happened in 1973, but that mentality after atrocities have happened, especially if you're in country and you have seen it, you've seen family members, you've seen innocent people, uh, journalists, uh, anyone uh, who could harm the regime, uh, uh, denied these rights, you can see how it might happen, you see. Uh, one other point, Steve mentioned the representation in, in the assumption of guilt. Well, in, in, in most civilized countries, including the U.S., there's, an, there's a presumption of innocence, even when someone looks to be as guilty as sin. And this harkens back to John Adams in the United States when he, when he volunteered to represent the British soldiers who had massacred American colonists. Uh, and he suffered, Adams did. He became president of the United States not long after. But at the time, he was shunned by uh, fellow colonists and others, but he set the, 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 the tone for the United States, and that is that, that even the, the, the guiltiest person or the guiltiest appearing person is entitled to representation uh, in a fair trial. And, and uh, those of you who know what the, re the result of those trials is that three or four of those British soldiers were acquitted, uh, even though they looked like they were guilty of sin. And the similar thing happened at Nuremberg. There were some acquittals. At, at Nuremberg. So the insecurity of any government at a time of atrocities uh, has to be viewed with a backward looking lens, but understanding why they might have taken this approach, not excusing it, because it's not it's not the civilized approach, of course, but just by way of putting everything on the table. But Toby, uh, give us in, in brief fashion your iteration of, of the of the bad. What what is, what what is this court done that is really uh, unacceptable? Well, um, it's it's very difficult to put it into thirty minutes or five minutes for how bad things are. But just focusing on just a couple of the points that, that, that you both mentioned. So when when Stephen's talking about the nineteen seventy three act and, and how the fundamental rights of the accused were removed. Um, and, and I completely take the point that in the immediate aftermath of conflict, uh, there is a sense of pursuing victim's justice. And, and actually, in all of our final trial briefs and, and all of our appeal briefs, we quote Justice Jackson when, when he said that, uh, and, I, and I won't quote it verbatim because I'm, I'll get it wrong, but basically, you know, if, you're, if you're determined to execute a man in any event, uh, there's, there's no occasion for a trial. And so we have 
extensively argue that point, but it's important to note that it was a first constitutional amendment that withdrew fundamental rights. It's not just the rights that we would recognize that contained in the Constitution or contained in the Central Treaties. So all of those fundamental rights that are, are, are contained that go to fair trial have been removed. And it actually explicitly states that those charged under the International Crimes Tribunal. So specifically in relation to, the, to these cases. But not only that, the legislation um, prohibits any challenge to the legislation itself, to the jurisdiction of the tribunal, and to the appointment of any, any particular judge. So taking a very extreme example, um, we are prevented from challenging and seeking the removal of a judge on any ground. And we did have occasion to, to request the recusal of one of the judges, because and, and this was really the first controversy, and it's important to note that there have been many controversies over the last few years, and each one seems to overshadow the last. So the first one was that we became aware that the, the chairman of the tribunal was previously a member of an investigative commission that had investigated these very cases several years previously. And so it was our opinion that he couldn't possibly sit as a judge. And so we sought his refusal. That was denied. And uh, the other judges left it to the, uh, as they put the, the, the good conscience of the judge in question. Regrettably, the good judge didn't have much conscience. So, so he, he continued to sit. And then this was then followed um, sometime later by um, a release of uh, discussions, uh, Skype conversations and, and emails that the judge had had with third parties about how these cases were, were, were prepared and how they had had discussions with members of the government and how they discussed it with the prosecution. And so that judge was then forced to, re to resign as a result of that. And then another judge appointed. But, you know, there have been numerous times where we've, we've felt it necessary to, to seek the removal of a, of a judge to ensure that the, the, the trial process is not only fair, um, but it has the appearance of fairness. And, and uh, unfortunately, we've been stopped at every opportunity. Um, Stephen also spoke about the, the issue with where some of the, uh, the witnesses uh, were, were refusing to come forward, or at least that's, that's what the prosecution had set out. And so what they, what they tried to do, and succeeded regrettably, was to have all of their evidence um, heard by way of a statement alone. And we had no opportunity to challenge that evidence. And one of our central allegations was that the, the chief investigator who had taken these statements um, had, had misled the court and had fabricated many of the, the statements. So we had no opportunity to challenge that. And regrettably, one of the witnesses in question, and Stephen alluded to this um, slightly, and I'll, I'll elaborate because it is one of the most fundamental issues that we faced. Um, there was a particular witness who, who had given evidence that his brother was killed by, um, in his statement by, by the defendant. And this was really the only evidence to support that charge. Now, this witness had allegedly disappeared and was no longer available to, to the prosecution. So his statement was uh, was accepted by the court. And so when we were approaching the end of the, the trial, and, and it's also important to note that in each and every case, we have been prevented from uh, presenting the full extent of our case case. So once we've called four or five witnesses, the, the tribunal has taken steps to, as they, they call, uh, to, to guillotine the, the defense case, because we've taken too long to bring our witnesses. And so the case had been closed, arbitrarily in our view, and we had made contact with this witness, we had located him, and he was prepared to give a statement for the defense, saying, one, the defendant did not kill my brother, and two, I was forced to say so by the investigators. And so we brought him to the tribunal, and he was abducted by uh, members of the security forces, uh, police, he was, uh, by his own words, 
held and uh, interrogated him for weeks on end. And then he was, um, <coughs> sorry, sorry, I remember last time. And he was then um, found in India uh, three months later. Take a sip. No, no, and so, so we've raised this repeatedly, um, and, and there's been no investigation at all. And this man now stands to, to um, his appeal is ongoing, and, and he's likely to be the next uh, um, execution. So, you know, we can, there are numerous instances of, of, of attempts by the government, by um, judicial and prosecutorial misconduct. And so to, to go through all of these would, would, would take well, hours. Yeah, I think you've given us a flavor of, of these, and there are many, many others uh, like the ones you mentioned uh, with, with the terrible problems of fairness, denial of, of uh, uh, procedure. Um, but if someone were, were sitting in this chair, uh, we might hear the justification that I've seen in writing decision was made either expressly or, you know, as, as things happen, that yes, you might be sacrificing <coughs> your procedural fairness, but it's in the name of, of achieving a substantive justice. Uh, what's your reaction to that justification? Well, that was actually used uh, recently in, in an article, I think, by a professor of Bangladeshi origin, where, where he, he referred to defects in nitpicking um, and <coughs> these matters, as, as terrible as they are, um, are acceptable when you look at the, the, the notion of sub substantive justice. The problem that you face is, and this is an argument that we've repeatedly raised over the last three years, is that if you, if you arbitrarily um, try and convict and execute um, a number of individuals, there is, of course, going to be a response to that. It, it, it shows that the, the process is stage managed as, as we believe it is from, from the very beginning to the very end. Um, and, and it serves no lasting purpose whatsoever. Uh, and you, know, you can compare this to, to other systems where they, they've attempted to bring an end to impunity for those deemed most responsible on trial. And in order to go to the next stage of, of looking at a system of reconciliation, long-term reconciliation. You need to ensure that the process stands up to scrutiny. And regrettably, this process does not stand up to any scrutiny at all. And, um, just the final point that I make, I, I represent one, one side. So uh, what I say um, has been repeatedly criticized by the government to the extent that I was um, detained at the airport and thrown out of the country and told never to come back. Um, but it's not just my words. Um, the, the ambassador has has been uh, very kind to the government when he says that uh, his recommendations were accepted from some some part. And the, the truth of the matter is, they were not at all. And those that have been accepted are never practically applied. So you so you had the, the the recommendations of the U.S. government. You had the United Nations. You had nearly every reputable human rights organization has criticized this process. And you can even go back as far as 1972 when the International Commission of Jurists recommended that there should be a process under international supervision. And really that's that's where we are now, is that this is a process that cannot be allowed to continue in this way, and it has to be under UN supervision. Uh, I have, uh, it's, it's, it's Toby's turn in terms of the questions though I've been uh, peppering them a little bit, but, um, but let's, let, let's not lose the point that you made that, in, in a very casual way. You were ordered out of the country in 2011. You haven't been back to Bangladesh since then, and you're not welcome to go back. That's right. And because, you, because of your expressing your views about the, the fairness of, of, of the tribunal. But uh, here's my two-part question, and again, a brief answer, Toby. Uh, you, you've practiced before all these tribunals. You've read. And most of you are familiar with that there were growing pains. The, uh, the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, and Rwanda, and uh, Lebanon, and uh, Cambodia.
Cambodia, they, they all went through kind of rough periods, obstacles to overcome uh, growing pains. Uh, is that part of the problem here, or, or is it a matter of degree and magnitude uh, of the kinds of, of missteps that, that this court is taking compared to the other tribunals? And then I'd like you, both of you, to answer, uh, can it be overcome, what they've done, can it be overcome so that they do become uh, a reputable, respected, uh, fair tribunal? That's the two parts. I'd like both of you to react to, to, to those two parts. Well, I think the, the first part is primarily, um, of course, every institution has its growing pains, and, and um, there were requests at the outset to, to invite the um, ambassador's uh, recommendations, but also to solicit the advice of the United Nations. Um, but it's very much, I'm going to ask you a question, and I'd like you to respond with the answer that I'm going to give you don't give me the answer, I'm not going to ask you any more questions. So what, what they've effectively done is they've sought the assistance of the international community. They don't like the answer that you've given, and so then they've ignored it. They have closed the door to the system from, from every source, whether it's from the US, the United Kingdom, the United Nations, and I'll, and I'll give you one example. The, the International Center for Transitional Justice, uh, based in New York, had, uh, had initiated a process where they would give assistance to judges and prosecutors to get them up to a certain level. And so they arranged a, a, a study trip for, for the judges to, to go to The Hague to observe the ICC, to observe the Lebanon Tribunal, the Islam Tribunal, and give them an opportunity to answer or ask questions <coughs> on, on how to deal with these very difficult cases and to ensure that the quality of the evidence that they're hearing was of a standard that the conditions could be brought upon. Well, because of the manner in which the tribunal then um, carried on, the ICTJ then cut its program and has provided no assistance to, to the tribunal as a result of that, which is regrettable. Because most institutions now, noting how these trials have been conducted, have effectively washed their hands of them. Now, if they're European-based organizations, a lot of that is based on the death penalty. Um, and it is particularly regrettable. We, we, try to convince all of these organizations, the United Nations included, you cannot wash your hands with this process. You have to uh, insist and ensure that uh, a, an appropriate standard of justice is applied. Just washing your hands and walking away um, is, is, is no answer, because what you're going to see is a number of these individuals summarily convicted and executed. An important point in that regard, and it's become more important we are talking about the almost entire leadership of a conservative Islamist political party. So executing those individuals, of course, is going to uh, see a response. And we have seen a response to that. I mean, even there have been statements of concern by a number, a host of uh, uh, Muslim countries, there have been uh, Islamic organizations have raised their concern. And even as we've been warning for a very long time that um, Al-Qaeda has also issued a statement in that regard as well, expressing concern as to how Islamist leaders are being treated in Bangladesh. So that is one of the issues. It's not just growing pains. That the, the government has been given every opportunity to address these concerns, and they have failed to do so because of a number of different reasons, primarily because they want to do it this way, and they will not be told. To get to part two of my question, then. What, uh, what's it going to take? Well, I think there are, there are two things that can be done. Um, first of all, the, the trials have to, the whole trial process has to be stopped now. And there has to be a complete review. Stop the trial process right yep, now? Yep, it has to be stopped now. There has to be a complete review of the entire process. There have to be judges and prosecutors properly selected based on their expertise, not based on party affiliation. Um, and it needs to come under international supervision. It is absolutely essential that international judges prosecutors um, assist in this process because Bangladesh has shown that it is neither willing nor capable of doing it without that assistance. And then the second point is that going back to the point I made at the beginning that it, it is in my view better to hold trials in areas where the crimes are committed. 
So you have to really look at whether holding these trials in Bangladesh um, will impact upon regional stability, and I believe it will. If they continue to do this, it will impact upon regional stability. India and Pakistan both have uh, very much uh, a lot to lose uh, in relation to this process. And already in December, when the first defendant was executed, there was a very strong response from, from the, uh, the Pakistan National Assembly condemning what happened. So, so there is a, a regional component. So the trial should be moved out of Bangladesh to ensure that justice is applied. Okay. Steve, take the, that two-part question, and then we're going to get to one more question from me. Uh, and then I want to uh, leave 15 minutes for audience questions. So. Well, uh, first of all, as you, I mean, I think if we go back to the beginning of your question, you were talking about, obviously, in these international courts, you do have growing chains. You have challenges. and. Uh, the, the approach that we try to take is to, is, to, is to look at what other courts have done and to overcome them, to, to learn lessons and, and hard, hard, <laughs> hard learn lessons at some of these uh, courts. And, and there are approaches to this kind of crime. Uh, you know, we all know that it's challenging to prove what happened 42 years ago when many eyewitnesses are, have, have passed along and when memories fade and, and when people may have a, May, may gain a kind of collective attitude about what happened, and it's not based upon what they themselves uh, uh, you know, um, uh, saw or, or witnessed. Uh, but there are ways to, to overcome that, and, and we've spent some time with international organizations uh, urging them to, to, to look at these things. And I know when I was there meeting with the prosecution, I would sit and say, now look, you know, this is how we were able to prove these crimes uh, a decade after the, after the fact. And, uh, I must say, the, the, the initial reaction that I had was, we don't need any of that. These guys are guilty. Uh, Three million people were killed. 200,000 women were raped. That's what the leader of the country said at the time. And, and, and I said, well, that, that can be true. And, and, and presumably, you can prove that quite easily. But how do you prove these people are responsible? And that there are ways to do that if you can show a command uh, relationship, if you can show uh, 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 some kind of joint enterprise in which uh, one person is doing this and another person is doing that with a common purpose. Uh, or, or if you can show that someone aided the, the, this particular uh, uh, act with, with knowledge, et cetera, the, and, and you can prove these things. And, and you know, classic attorneys might say, well, but can you, you know, are there witnesses? Well, can you use documents, et cetera? You can potentially use documents. Rules against hearsay don't, haven't been applied in international courts as long as substantial justice is done. And so there are ways to, to approach these issues and, and, and to overcome them. Uh, but, but always looking for the substantial justice of, of, of the process. And uh, the, um, you know, as, the, as, 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 the, as that went forward, I think, to, to be frank, the concern that we had was that, uh, to a large extent, uh, the evidence uh, didn't come forward. And it was very difficult for, for the, them to tie particular individuals to these crimes. Uh, and, to, and, and if you read the judgments, there's some leaps that, that are made. Uh, that, would, that further investigation might have might have uh, filled those gaps, and, and that international assistance and, and uh, could have helped them. Uh, and of course, if you can't close that leak, <laughs> if you can't connect that individual, then then you don't have a case. You need to you need to go elsewhere. And so, this is uh, there was the frustration was this attitude that you know we, these people have committed horrible crimes, therefore uh, they must be convicted uh, no matter what. And, and that's the kind of attitude. Concerned us and, and said that at the end of the day, if you don't respect the victims, you need to do it differently. Now, what can what can be done now? And, and obviously, uh, I mean, when we were when I was last out there, and no one had yet been executed, the cases were uh, then uh, just uh, reaching the, the appellate court, the criminal division, and the Supreme Court. It was, uh, I think, easier to talk about things that might be done to improve the process that, that's 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 there. And, and obviously, uh, given given what's happened today, it's, it's difficult, uh, I think, to, uh, uh, to fix things after, some things after the fact. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, if one were to approach this, um, you know, when uh, Toby talks about international supervision, uh, you know, uh, I don't envision that the international community is going to jump in there and say, we want to take over these trials. This is not a a situation, and we know the challenge of dealing with a situation like Syria today and getting a consensus about uh, a referral or some kind of international court mechanism. Uh, dealing with a situation in 1971 would be very difficult for the international community to come in and take it over. On the other hand, if, if the 
government itself were, were to reach out to the international community, suggest the kind of things that they did in Bosnia. The Bosnian state court is not an international court, uh, but it had international judges. It had international prosecutors. Uh, they were nominated by international groups, and but effectively uh, uh, then uh, appointed by a, a, a broad-based national judicial and prosecution council, etc. So uh, you could uh, develop that kind of structure and, and bring in people from uh, uh, from the international level uh, to join with Bangladesh lawyers uh, uh, to help uh, ensure the, the, the fairness and independence of the process. Uh, and, and that process could also include, as, as, as all legal processes do, uh, opportunities for people to petition for review if, if, if a particular proceeding didn't uh, uh, you know, fundamentally uh, violate the rights of the accused. So it, it's not impossible, uh, even at this late date, to, to think of, of, of that kind of approach. Of course, there have to be a will on the part of the international community to get involved. As Toby points out, the death penalty issue is there. And that does cause a problem with uh, the involvement of the United Nations and the European Union. It doesn't necessarily cause them. I mean, uh, we have in many states the death penalty in the United States. Uh, we certainly insist that if you have a court that uh, has the death penalty, that it only be reserved for, for cases in which uh, there's been an absolute and total uh, observance of the highest standards of due process and the strongest uh, proof uh, at the highest standard before you would execute that kind of, kind of punishment and, and, and it would have to reflect a, a truly heinous uh, crime and a major involvement. But many countries, I think, would, would be reluctant to come in uh, if that were still on the table. And as, as I recommended uh, back, in, uh, uh, back in 2011 in my letter, I said it would be better in terms of this process uh, if the death penalty were off the table and uh, if uh, the kind of sentence were a, were a life sentence and, then, uh, and uh, the, the problem that I think a lot of people had in Bangladesh because of the political polarization was well if we don't have a death sentence then if there's a political change in the future uh, then everyone will be freed after only a year or two in jail etc. So we, uh, uh, little like we had in America some of the jurors thought that the prisoners would be freed then many would vote for the death penalty if they realized that the alternative was a true life sentence then many jurors end up saying no we'll, we'll do that instead. So people had that kind of attitude. Well, to the extent that you develop a process that's, that's independent and impartial uh, and, and have an understanding by people on all political sides that whatever the results are should be honored and observed and that a sentence of life means life, uh, then I think that you can eliminate one of the strongest arguments for, 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 for a death penalty. And, but I, I think if you're really going to do this process now, you, you really need to take that off the table and, and have international participation uh, not because there aren't the very good people in Bangladesh, but because of the nature of the, of the process that's, that's going on to date, that, that that kind of inclusion, I think, would be essential to, to showing independence and impartiality. Okay. Well, uh, I have one more question, um, but I think what I'll do is hold it uh, and see what questions you have, and if there's time, I'll ask the question I have. If not, uh, I won't. So starting with my, my vision is here. We'll, we'll jump from one side of the room to the other. Your first brief question. Don't uh, make statements. Question. Uh, I had a, a brief, uh, brief answer. A, a, a few questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with a very uh, simple one, yes. which is um, thank you for organizing this panel discussion. Uh, I came in a little late, so uh, my first question is I wanted to hear two sides of the story, and I see there is a representation of the defense counsel and I don't see the thing that you are talking about, International Crimes Tribunal Bangladesh. There is any representation of International Crimes Tribunal Bangladesh. I don't see any, any representation of the victims. I don't see any representation of any Bangladeshi people. So my first question is actually to you. Why is this such a one-sided panel discussion? Uh, how, how late were you? I in? came in like 15 minutes late. Because you would have heard me say that the Bangladesh government asked the American Bar Association to hold this neutral forum. We agreed to do it. We invited distinguished guests. And two weeks ago, the Bangladesh government said they weren't going to send anybody. And so we've been trying our best to make it a balanced uh, presentation here with my questions and, and comments. Uh, but that's the answer to, you, to your, your question. Now let's move around, and if there's time, we'll come back to some of your other questions. And uh, on this, this side, yes. Hi, my name is Sarah. I'm 
My name is Gershani, and I'm with the Public International Law Policy Group. Um, and I have a question. So we look back years from now at the Bangladeshi Tribunal, and I'm wondering what your opinion of the ICT will, will be in the spectrum of international tribunals, be international, hybrid, or domestic. Do you think that this is going to be a case of, you know, the flaws of a purely domestic tribunal trying international atrocities? Well, I mean, first of all, there's, uh, uh, we, we strongly, the U.S. government, and, 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 and it's a principle of the ICC, believe in complementarity, and, and we would prefer to have justice at the national level. And, and, and we have examples, uh, certainly if you go to, to, to Latin America today, you'll see cases that arose out of the, uh, out of, uh, out of periods of what they often call the dirty war in Argentina, or uh, when, when, when people of the left or the right were, were, were mistreated, tortured, killed, etc. And cases are being tried at the, at, at the national level, and, and, and judgments are being reached uh, uh, that, are, that are being recognized uh, and, and respected uh, across those countries, etc. So it is possible, and many of those crimes, by the way, occurred in the 70s and 80s that are, that are being uh, prosecuted. So. It is possible for people to, to do it. I, I think here we'll, we have an example of that unless we, we see some changes in, in the approach, uh, will be viewed as, 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 a, as a national tribunal prosecuting international crimes, and, and uh, the deficiencies of, of that process will, will be much more prominent here than they are in, in, in some other experiences. Can I, okay. Uh, sorry, can I just correct Yeah, sure. Me? Um, I think when, when we first started looking at this process, um, this was potentially um, going to set an example of, of how the national jurisdiction could actually uh, be an important component of international criminal justice, and it could be looked upon as what to do in the future. Um, regrettably, I think my position would be this is precisely what never to do again. Okay, uh, way in the back. Brief question. Yes. Um, can, can you hear me without the microphone? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, this is really a truly factual question. Uh, how many, uh, how, what's the magnitude of this effort? How many defendants are there going to end up being? Who are they? I know that it seems to have started at the top of the food chain. How low in the food chain of potential offenders is it going? Uh, how many indictments are there? I'd just like to get a little bit of uh, background. I'm sorry. Look, I mean, it may be that I'm the only one ignorant of those details in the room. Um, regrettably, I don't think that you are the only one um, ignorant of this because most people really do not see what's going on in Bangladesh. So um, it hasn't really been something which has been openly discussed. Um, in, in terms of whether they're looking at only those at the top of the, the food chain, you say. Um, it's important to note that nobody from the Pakistani military has been or will be put on trial. Nobody from the Indian side, if they were alleged to have committed crimes, will be put on trial. Um, and it's only those who have uh, allegedly collaborated with the Pakistani military that are on trial. Um, you also have a, a presidential order that states that nobody that fought for liberation can be put on trial. So that's uh, another criticism of the process. In terms of um, how many people, we we have one person who's been executed, who was executed on the, on the 12th of December. Um, there was another defendant who died in custody um, just over a week ago. Um, ironically, he, he was previously prosecuted in 1973, convicted, sentenced to life imprisonment, and then, um, as part of an amnesty, released and has just been put on trial uh, again. Um, there is approximately 10 other cases either completed, awaiting appeal, or in the process. Um, in terms of who they are, they are predominantly members of jamaat e islami um, the Islamist political party. Um, there are uh, one leading member of the Bangladesh Nationalist Party, uh, but they're all those that may have opposed independence or liberation, um, and who are in some form, predominantly, but not exclusively, uh, members of opposition political parties. And, and in that regard, I should say that the, uh, you know, we're, we're talking obviously about uh, people that may have only been 20 years old or something at the time of these crimes. So we're, we're not necessarily, though, there's one very aged uh, accused uh, who was more prominent in 1971. Uh, these, are, these are generally not people who would have been high up uh, in, in 
culpability now, but by the same token, some of the Auschwitz guards and others that are being prosecuted today for crimes of the 1940s may not be necessarily prominent. Uh, the, generally, uh, the, the cases involve allegations that these, uh, that these uh, militias of, of, of the Bengali uh, uh, students, et cetera, that organized themselves to support the Pakistani side in the liberation war, in other words, oppose liberation, and form themselves as militias that had names like al Badr or Razakar, et cetera, that these militias were engaged in, in attacking Hindus, engaging in uh, attacking uh, secular uh, uh, Bengalis, et cetera. And, and indeed, there were uh, these crimes committed by organizations like that. The crucial question then is what role these individuals that are charged today played uh, in those events, et cetera. And that's, that's the proof that's, that would really be needed uh, to, to convict them. And, and, and that's been, as, as I note, if you, if you read the trial record, uh, the, the evidence has, has, has not been strong. And sometimes the connections between them and these killing units uh, uh, don't appear readily uh, in the evidence. So we have about five minutes left. And it's, it's, this, it's this side of the room's turn. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. I, I wanted to know, uh, I'm Shigov Tequim from uh, Bangladesh Service West America. Did the Bangladesh government give any reason why they were not sending representatives? Uh, they said they were unavailable, essentially. They, 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 we, we, uh, Kip Hale dealt with it directly. Kip, what, what more can you add to what I said? All they said was that um, uh, the ambassador at the time was um, uh, ill with some condition. That he was a replacement of a replacement. Um, and then there was an effort to secure another replacement and was unable to do so. Yeah. Okay, that was a short question. On uh, this side, uh, I'm trying to go back and forth even on this side. And so I think uh, this, this question, yes. Yes. Um, if the child were to stop, would the inclusion of victims as individuals I mean, I, I don't know what the position is ordinarily under the laws of Bangladesh whether injured parties, uh, victims can participate in proceedings. Um, but I think any any system which is aimed at reviewing the process and making a determination of what a future process should look like should involve civil society and victims groups. I don't think that there's anything wrong with that in terms of their voice being heard on what type, type of process should be established. But again, I don't know if that's permitted under a Bangladesh criminal procedure in normal proceedings. It is something that some of the victims' associations have raised in the past, but it's, it's not something that's, that's really been considered. And, and understand here, we're, we're generally following a sort of common law legal system where the prosecutor comes in and, and presents the evidence. Now, obviously, those of us that are involved in that kind of process, uh, you know, as, as prosecutors, believe ourselves very much then the representative of the victim and need to develop that relationship and that contact is what we, what we try to do. Uh, uh, you know, obviously in the ICC, uh, we now have victim representation in a, in a sort of global court, uh, but, but fundamentally here we're talking about trying to have a process that, that, that fits Bangladeshi law and traditions, but the best of those traditions and, and the closest and the greatest observance of, 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 of rights, uh, uh, particularly given the, the, the historic importance of these cases. Uh, but this side, we, we have time for maybe another two or three quick questions. Anyone else on this side? Okay. Yes. Oh, <clears throat> my question to Mr. Rapp. Uh, I think in your last public appearance in Europe, uh, you mentioned that during the appeals process, some of the shortcomings in the trial of ICT will be taken care of. But unfortunately, we have seen uh, one life sentence turned into that sentence, which was horribly wrong. So what is the responsibility of the international community uh, now to stop this injustice in the name of justice? Well, I understand uh, uh, it's, it's important for the international community when it comes to, to, to international human rights guarantees to, to speak out and, and to express our, our views uh, and, and, and to try to, to, uh, 
think that those those standards have been adhered to. Uh, you're referring obviously to the to the Mola case uh, where um, he was sentenced uh, to life at trial. Uh, the law did not allow a prosecution appeal. Uh, the law under popular pressure then was changed to allow a prosecution appeal, and uh, on that appeal, um, the the conviction was was essentially upheld and the sentence uh, turned into a death sentence. Uh, at the time, I, I uh, spoke uh, to that issue and said that it was very important uh, that, uh, that there be a review of, of a decision like that. Now, in, in the end, uh, the first period of time when the IDP would have been reviewed by the Supreme Court was opposed, in the end, it was reviewed by the court itself, the same court that had rendered that decision. And I think that most of us would say, that in terms of the right of appeal, the right of appeal doesn't mean going back to the same court that decided it. It needs to be to, to, to another court. So there was a, a serious concern under international human rights law about the execution taking place under the circumstances, and, and I made that clear. And, and certainly urged the government to, not to go ahead, uh, and they did. Uh, since then, we haven't had other executions. So we hope that uh, that now, of course, we're, we're not dealing now generally with situations where there was no death sentence at the trial. There are many cases in which there are death sentences trial, and, and so, so there will be appeal, but, uh, but uh, our position remains the same uh, in terms of, of looking at the review of a death sentence uh, by a, a court on appeal, and that is that uh, uh, for, for the execution of, of this kind of supreme punishment, which is permitted under international civil rights, uh, well, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, death, death sentence it is allowed, but these should be reserved for cases in which the evidence is extremely strong and in which uh, uh, all of the procedural guarantees have, have, have been observed and, and we think uh, that that kind of review would result in a situation where uh, where, where death sentence is maybe set aside. But we're out of time and uh, I want to bring it to a close. We I have to bring it to a close, but I do want to make a couple of very quick uh, observations, final observations. Ambassador Rapp came to China when I was there uh, last fall. I teach a course in China called International Criminal Justice. It starts with the Nuremberg Trials and it comes all the way forward to the present day. Uh, if you haven't taken a course on international criminal law or international criminal justice, I suggest that you do so because this subject is of critical importance to, uh, the, to the world in terms of dealing with atrocities that never seem to end. We thought that after World War II and the cry of no more, never again, uh, but it's happening again and again and again. The International Criminal Court is the only permanent uh, tribunal. The other courts, as those of you are aware, are being phased out. The uh, Yugoslav Tribunal, Rwanda Tribunal, uh, they're being transitioned so that by 2016 or 2017, the only court, international court, will be the ICC. We've had today discussion of uh, essentially a, a fundamental precept of the, of the Rome Statute that created the ICC, this complementarity. Both of our speakers have referred to it. In, in a nutshell, complementarity means that in Rome, in, two, in 1998, when 160 nations came together and met for two weeks and created the Rome Statute, the fundamental premise one would argue, of the, of the Rome Statute is the assurance that the International Criminal Court, once it started operating, would, would respect the right of sovereign uh, nations to try their own uh, cases. And so complementarity means that the, that the ICC is a court of last resort, not first resort. The first resort is the national courts. Today we've, we've heard of, of that complementarity principle which doesn't really apply because everything that happened here in Bangladesh pre predates the existence of the ICC. And as we mentioned earlier, there, the ICC, no, no tribunal, especially, can take over this case. But it's a lesson to us. It's a lesson that even under complementarity, when we have uh, the ICC, if it had jurisdiction in this case, would still have looked to Bangladesh to try this case unless Bangladesh was unwilling or unable genuinely to do justice in this case. I think, I think we've seen that justice has not been done. 
and there's a, there's a threat that it, that will continue unless something happens. So my last comment, and, and uh, a quick question, a yes or no, is using my prosecutorial skills. Um, for each of our speakers, uh, does the Bangladesh experience argue that the international legal community should do more, should redouble its efforts to strengthen the International Criminal Court so that it is available, even as a last resort, to step in in a situation like this when a national court is unable or unwilling